Hi, everyone. It's Stephanie with The Patient Story. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're joining us from. I am really thrilled to introduce you to our special guest today, and she has so much to share, um, not just as you know, someone who's gone through cancer treatment, but someone who's worked in healthcare and someone who's close to her family and just so much. So Connie, I'd really like to welcome you today. Thanks, Stephanie. It's really nice having you. I know we have a lot to get through, but before we start to talk about your multiple myeloma experience, I'd really love for you to just, you know, introduce yourself um, the way you would at a party. You know, what, what are you about? Because you're not okay. just about cancer, right? Right. You're right. That's really important too. Like I sometimes think I have the identity in our small community as the lady with cancer. And I, I don't like that. So um, I've been married um, like 36 years to my high school sweetheart, Greg, and um, we have three wonderful, amazing children and proud to say that they're all like um, doing very successful careers right now. And um, I was raised on a ranch in Wyoming. And so I'm a Wyoming cowgirl. And yet I balance that with um, I still like to be pampered a little bit with a pedicure and things like that. So I'm not like you're totally roughing it type cowgirl. So um, from a big family. So I guess that's about it. Oh, I love it. And then both my sons fought fires for um, the, the BLM and were, you know, sleeping out under the stars and they have no desire to ever do that again. So I don't blame them. <laughs> uh, yeah. Sleeping out of the stars has a different meaning, I guess, when you're yeah. doing it for yeah. work. Um, well, Connie, thank you for sharing that with us. Um, you know, again, like I said, there's a lot to get through because uh, I think people know, and, and a lot of our listeners and viewers, um, that multiple myeloma is very treatable, but it's not curable. And so they're, are a lot of different treatments people usually end up, you know, going on and through. So Connie, before we go there, it's been about 10 years almost yes. um, that you've been living with myeloma. Can you bring us back to what were those first symptoms for you? And, um, and yeah, what, what made you decide to go get checked out? Yeah, well, um, I had a lot of chronic pain and I guess I, I didn't think that anything serious was going on because one day maybe my right side would hurt and then the next day the left side and then maybe I would have a headache. Um, I had, when I walked a lot, I would get a pain in my shoulder in the back, you know, and I even, um, my chest was tender and I, I had had a cough. Um, I actually went to the ER once with, with pain in my chest and I had slight bronchitis, so ended up getting treated for that. And, um, I had, I had slipped on the ice. And so my hip hurting, I had it attributed to that. And by the time I actually went, I had, um, four broken ribs and a, a small hole in my sternum lesions in my skull and spine. And, um, I actually was in pretty bad shape, but I had, uh, made excuses for it. Just thought that I was a a busy mom was why I was so tired. And, um, but I was actually working at a hospital. So once I did go to see a doctor, she was like, she actually said, I've seen you limping down the halls and sent me immediately for a CT scan. So it just, I mean, thank goodness you worked in that setting and someone, you know, said something. Right. Good. So, um, we won't go into all of the, this is back in 2012. Um, we're in, we're in January of 2012. Um, after you go through all the different, you know, tests and scans, can you recall how you were diagnosed that moment you heard? Um, it did take a while because I was at a small community hospital and I had had thyroid cancer in 2001. So originally um, they thought it was metastatic from thyroid cancer, which would have been actually worse. So in some ways, I got the better of two evils when you found out it was multiple myeloma. But I went to a little larger facility and had a um, bone marrow biopsy. And then that's when they determined that it was multiple myeloma. So this was your second cancer diagnosis. Yeah, right. Can you, um, I mean, 
that's of course like hitting the lottery twice, right? It's just this the numbers game that that's so crazy sometimes to think about. Can you describe what that feeling was? I mean, you'd ha- you'd heard it before. Well, the thing of it, it was is it had been um, well over five years, so like eleven years since my thyroid cancer, and I had really, as as they say, like putting that on and put cancer way on the top shelf, I can honestly, I mean, maybe I should have thought, oh, all these aches and pains would have, you know, I have cancer, but I, I never thought about cancer. I mean, thyroid cancer is so curable that I just was like, um, honestly was only having like yearly checkups. So at that time for thyroid. And so it was just a big shock to find out that it was in multiple myeloma and, um, you know, I was only 46 years old. And so it, it was, it was quite a shock. Yes. Very young to be diagnosed with multiple myeloma. We know it tends to be more like 70 is right. around that age. Um, so, so you were diagnosed. Um, do you have any guidance for people in terms of like first things to do when you get a cancer diagnosis? Um, boy, that's a good question. I, I think um, accept the support that uh, people do want to help. And sometimes we, we just want to handle it all our, ourselves or try to be strong. And I think it's, um, I'm kind of a people person. So I knew that I needed to be surrounded by friends and family. And that, that really helps get you through, you know, and, and I also, um, I was always really honest with my kids, you know, they, they weren't, you know, little though, then my, my daughter was a freshman in high school and my um, son had just, oldest son had graduated from law school and my middle son was in college. So they were old enough to understand, but I, I didn't hold anything back. And I I think that that's um, good because they can't help you if they don't know what's truly going on. Right. We've heard that from others too, in terms of how to deal with a cancer diagnosis with your children. Of course, it depends on their age, but being honest and open if possible tends to be pretty common. Um, So thank you, Connie, for that. I, I, I see here that you did. And so March 9th, 2012, again, so a couple months after you're diagnosed, you start your first IV chemo with Cyborg D. You did achieve complete remission, but they said you need to undergo a stem cell transplant anyway. Uh, so you did, and that was November 15th. Um, can you talk a little bit, what's your guidance really for people in terms of what to expect with a stem cell transplant? Um, gosh, kind of have to reflect back a little bit. A stem cell transplant is pretty hard to go through, but you know, I just sort of looked at it as like, well, that is the, the normal suggestion. That is the standard of care. So if pretty much all multiple myeloma patients are doing that leukemia. If, if someone else can do it, I can do it. Right. You know, and, um, and I also knew that a lot of people were older than me going, going through, like you said, multiple myeloma. So um, I always want to know everything about it. And so, you know, ask, I would say, ask your doctor lots of questions and go to it. Like I could have had the stem cell in a smaller um, facility, but when we asked like how many stem cells they did a year, they said, Oh, about a dozen. Well then instead I chose to go to MD Anderson that does like six or seven a day. I think on the floor I was on, you know, the floor, I, like, uh, I wanted where it was a common thing and where the nurses only worked in like stem cells so that I would have really that very top level care that was important to me. And, and the process of it, just high level, um, in terms of, cause I know you had pre-chemo, what was that? Um, the, the pre- schedule. Chemo, yeah. yeah. I, ooh, gee. I actually don't really re- remember exactly what the schedule was for the pre-chemo, but I know that it was a really tough one and it is the one that, uh, the only time I lost my hair was from that chemo treatment. And so, um, it, it definitely, you know, makes you very sick. And the, the goal is to get your white count down to like zero so that then they can give you back your stem cells that hopefully aren't um, corrupted with cancer anymore. So um, you really have to be quite 
quite sick for them to kind of bring you back and start getting you healthy again. Absolutely. Um, yeah, it was a long time ago. I think more in the sense of, do you remember about how long you were in the hospital? Because of course, not like a one day thing. Yeah, it was almost a month because like you said, it was November 15th. Well, I got to um, be home for Christmas and I actually think that we flew home on December 18th. So, and I know that the um, doctors were a little bit hesitant to let me go, but yet they knew that like, you know, it was going to do me really good to be home for Christmas. So I'd already spent, I spent Thanksgiving in the, in the hospital and um, my husband, Greg was with me, but our three kids were with um, their grandparents and stuff like that. And it was just, it was really hard to even have a holiday away from my family. So. Yeah. And those are the tough things that we don't really read about online when it comes to cancer treatments and diagnoses, right? It's, like being away from family, how emotionally difficult that is, how mentally yeah, and, yeah. and spiritually draining is, you know, being in a hospital for almost a month or whatever, you know, that length is. Um, and I do want to mention, and not everyone's going to experience this, you did end up having this bacterial infection, H. pylori, and um, after the stem cell transplant. But what you said, Connie, in our conversation earlier, I think is great for people to listen to, is less so about the actual infection and more about the fact that your body was telling you something, right? Right, right. I um, had extreme nausea. I had, you know, had nausea for a hundred days. And basically I associated food with evil because almost every time I tried to eat something, I threw up. And so I was, I was existing on, you know, a few bites of yogurt a day, um, maybe a piece of apple or, you know, and I would try to drink water, but um, I ended up losing about 50 pounds with the stem cell and it continued to lose weight. And so it was really fortunate that my family provider found out that I had the H pylori because I started to get well soon, soon after that, because really it was causing a lot of that was causing a lot of the acid reflex and the vomiting, not the stem cell um, transplant side effects. Yeah. yeah. No. And, and Connie, I'm so glad you bring that up and talk about it in the context of, Hey, if you feel something, bring it up because, you know, I think a lot of us just want to think, well, this is probably, this is probably just part of part of the deal. Um, instead yeah. of yeah. asking. Right. And that's what I did think like, well, you know, this is, I guess how sick I'm supposed to be. And, I, I think it's always a good idea to to share with your oncologist just how sick you really are, like specifically, you know, whether you're not eating, you know, they they need to know that because maybe they haven't really noticed how um, unless you tell them they can't notice that you're you haven't really eaten at all. So. Right. Right. It, it is on us and as patients and as caregivers to be you know, looping them in, looping people in um, yeah. and speaking up for ourselves. And so, so Connie, I know that that was the end of 2012. You got to spend the holidays with your family, thankfully. Right. Um, and then you were on Revlimid, uh, on maintenance, and it was for 15 months and you were in remission in right. those 15 months. Yeah. Um, then, then April of 2014 hits. And uh, by the way, as you're on maintenance, how had your, had your doctor helped you understand with expectation setting? Like, look, we're going to try to put you in remission for as long as possible, but relapses is going to happen. Yes. They, they, um, my oncologist, the one that I've been, my main one that I've had out of MD Anderson was always very honest with me. And I appreciated that. And she was like, um, saying, you know, it more than likely it, it will come back, but this, you know, using the maintenance therapy will keep it away longer. And, you know, the Revlimid wasn't very hard on me at that time. And I had a, a very good quality of life then, except for I still had a lot of pain because the damage that was done, like to the ribs in the back from, you know, from the earlier myeloma, I still had some of those lesions and a, a lot of bone pain. And so wasn't able to work or do some of those like really normal activities, you know, but um, I, I could enjoy going to my daughter's sporting events and, you know, um, socialize with my kids and go to football games or things like that, you know, and um, just wasn't able to, you know, go 
go run or something, you know. You were largely, I mean, I think mentally, I'm very curious to knowing that some people might think, oh, it feels like, a, was it a cloud? Like you're constantly thinking about it or were you able to try and live in the present? Like, what was that for you? Um, I don't, I don't think it was always a cloud. I think that it was making me, you know, the thing about cancers are truly does make you think about how you should treasure every day. And for the most part, I, I was trying to do that. And so you're, you, you don't want to be down worrying all the time, but yet, you know, like everyone, anytime a scan came up or whatever, then, then you got nervous and thought about it more, you know. Thank you.